Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Joan Reed. I'm Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And thank you for joining us for this leadership forum on Asian American and Pacific Islander women in leadership, anti-racism, allyship, and growing navigational capital sponsored by the Harvard Medical School's Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge and thank the three individuals who really put this program together. A special thank you to Dr. Tracy Yang, Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health Policy at Harvard, uh, Ying Wang, Associate Director of the Minority Faculty Development Program, and Susan Legier, Special Project Manager both in the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, and also to share some housekeeping notes with everyone. All lines will be muted and the chat will not be available for participants. However, live close captioning is available and you can turn that on yourselves. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function within this webinar. And there will be a very short period at the end of the webinar uh, in which uh, you'll be, see a poll. Uh, and please take the time to answer those questions. It's only a minute or so. This webinar is being recorded and the, it will be available on the DICP, Diversity Inclusion Community Partner website after the program. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Uh, Tercita Batiola, President and CEO of the International Community Health Services. And our panelists are, uh, Dr. Monica Burrell, Senior Advisor to the Mayor of Boston and former Commissioner of Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Dr. Kimberly Jun, Chief Equity Officer at Massachusetts General Institute of Health Professions. Jennifer Wong, uh, Dr. Jennifer Wong, Pediatric Dermatologist at Boston Children's Hospital. And Priya Pathija, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the American Heart our Hospital Association. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote for today, Teresita Batiola, who is President and CEO of the International Community Health Services, IH, ICHS in Seattle, Washington. It is the state's largest Asian and Pacific Islander nonprofit health center, providing medical, dental, behavioral health, pharmacy, acupuncture, and other health services to all those who need affordable care, especially immigrants and refugees. ICHS serves nearly 28,000 patients annually at 11 service locations that are located in Seattle, Bellevue, and Shoreline. ICH's community impact goes far beyond clinic visits, and staff serve annually around 400,000 health encounters in community settings through education, health fairs, pop-up clinics, and other outreach efforts that address health disparities and issues of equity. It has a broader impact with national, state, and local governments and communities through the championship of legislation, policies, programs, and funding that improve the health status of the most vulnerable through access to high quality, affordable care. Ms. Batiola was appointed by the Washington State Governor to the Seattle College's Board of Trustees and continues to serve after a term as its board chair. She is a long time member of the boards of the Association of the American Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, the Washington Association of Community Health and Community Health Plan and Network. More recently, President Biden has nominated her to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Her family immigrated from the Philippines in 1969 and she received her Bachelor of Arts in Public Affairs from Seattle University, Masters of Science from Urban, in Urban Administration from Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. And she was a National Urban Fellow serving a stint as staff to a US cabinet member. And now I turn the podium over to Ms. Batiola. Magandang araw sa inyong lahat. A beautiful day to all of you. Thank you so much, Joan, for introducing me. And uh, you slipped there and called me a doctor. So I will just say I am not a doctor uh, by any means. But I am very grateful to the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership and the dynamic team that put this program together. I'm also extremely grateful, or maybe not so grateful, to Dr. Kimberly Chang, 
a family dog at Asian Health Services in Oakland. She's a leader in national community health and an advocate for the underserved Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, especially those people who have been affected by human trafficking and exploitation. She's also the winner of the 2020 Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health Emerging Leaders and numerous other recognitions. So yay, Dr. Kim, thank you for being part of my extended friends and network. So today, please extend me your grace and kindness. This is my first virtual keynote, though I am a very experienced public speaker uh, by myself and also in many, many panels, both live and remote. So I am not used to staring in the camera. I will do my best to do that, but I also have to disclose that I have notes uh, that I am reading. Uh, so I hope I do a credible job. This is not a scholarly presentation, but a combination of my experiences and observations. So again, grace and kindness are very much appreciated. I've been invited to talk about my experience as a leader in the Asian Pacific Islander communities. But what we will do is we will talk story. And in the process, I plan to cover my leadership journey and how the challenges that relate to my identity as an Asian American woman, as Filipino American woman, and as someone who is now swept into the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander nomenclature. So we will talk about that a little later. Because we are in the healthcare, I will also talk about the most pressing healthcare needs that I see in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders community. And I do hope that today piques your interest to learn more and to do more. So let's talk about history, her story and my story. The world is large and seductive. Over time, stronger or bigger countries have exercised rights over other countries to control lands, seas, natural resources, and people. It is in this vein that Spain controlled the Philippines for three centuries in the 16th to the 19th centuries. Filipino names became Spanish names. Filipinos became Catholics because it was better to accept the cross or die by the sword. It is ancient history, but it is a precursor to the history of Filipinos and Filipino Americans in the United States. Filipinos first arrived in the United States in the late 1800s in California and in Louisiana through the galleon trade those big sailing ships that brought plunder and did trade all around the world on behalf of Spain. These Filipinos were likely slaves fleeing those galleon uh, ships. In 1898, the United States declared war against Spain over Cuba, but it swept the Philippines into the war because we were Spain's other colony. Over the centuries under Spain, the Filipinos fought for its independence and Filipinos saw the Americans as allies in that independence movement. But when the United States won the Spanish-American War, the Philippines found itself as a colony. So from 1900 to 1934, Filipinos became US nationals, but could not have full rights as, as American citizens, though Filipinos did live legally in the US. We became quickly the cheap source of labor for farms on the West Coast in Hawaii, cheap source of labor for factory work in the Alaskan fishing and cannery industry, or we were custodians, busboys, and domestic workers. Restrictions of Filipino entry and anti-miscegenation laws led to many pockets of isolated Filipinos with little or no family ties. This group of immigrants is what led to the founding of the organization I lead today, the International Community Health Services. 
In the 1970s, amidst the struggle for civil and human rights, the Asian American community, meaning the Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese American communities, which were the communities present in the United States in the 70s, all three communities banded in outrage over the living conditions of poor, elderly Filipino and Chinese men who were alone and in failing health. They were living in deteriorating single room occupancy hotels. Though the term Asian American was natal at that time, it was the first important self-identification made by the three distinct communities in California and also in Washington state, in Seattle. And these three communities together as Asian Americans fought discrimination and racism and championed better living conditions and healthcare for these men. From this time period, from the 30s to the 60s, Filipino immigration grew, even though national uh, quotas were limited to 20,000 Filipinos a year for the entire country, there were exceptions. And the Navy and other military branches really found you know, a golden vein in terms of signing up Filipinos to serve in the Navy and other military branches. However, in 1965, a new immigration act did away with the national origins quotas and opened the doors for family reunification and employment-based immigration, leading to many healthcare and other professional workers that we have today. That's why we ended up with many nurses and other healthcare workers. And we ended up with engineers and other professionals in the United States from the Philippines. And this is where my family enters the American novella. Like many immigrants, our family left to seek a better life in the United States. The Philippine economy was destabilizing as fast as the politics contracted in the hands of the few powerful. We reached in Seattle in 1969 with my father, an engineer, hopeful of getting a job with Boeing, but 1969 was the start of a 15 year recession when Boeing lost the supersonic jet contract to Airbus. As my parents struggled to support us, my siblings and I were able to get into school. My father, who was a, an engineer, became a steam fitter, but he swallowed his pride because it was important to support the family. It was a hard scrabble existence but it was confusing and awakening time for me. Still under the thumb of my parents, I was initially pressed by them to volunteer with a Filipino nun who was also a nurse practitioner and doing a research project on the nursing needs of elderly Filipino men. Yes, the very same elderly men living in those single room occupancy hotels in Seattle's Chinatown. Talking to these elderly men, uncomfortable as I was, began to lift me from the immigration trauma, from being a sullen teen who was, who was herself feeling very isolated and depressed because I was exposed to others who had worse problems than, oh, poor me. The economic struggle for the new immigrant family continued as I moved through college, working a low wage job, as I tried to get even better jobs. Volunteering in the community meant I could be around and listen to the community firebrands, the barrier breakers, the ones who broke the stereotypes of the quiet Asians. Because I was afraid of my parents and their control I was even more afraid to join demonstrations and rallies. The volunteer work was small, handing out flyers, stuffing envelopes, sitting at registration desks, but each opportunity connected me to different people. Some were peers who became friends, and they're still friends, 
as they grew themselves in influence and in better positions and jobs. They'd become my longtime allies in the struggle for equality and justice. Community leaders began to see me, help me, and one became my mentor and surrogate mom who freely gave me praise and instinctively believed I was capable of great things. Ruth Wu was a humble person who preferred being behind the scenes, but wielded the phone and her Rolodex. And if you don't know what a Rolodex, it's a paper version of your digital directory. And it's Rolodex because it was round and rolled around. She was once an administrative assistant for a governor, but in that role, she learned how to use influence as her superpower. She totally believed the minorities should take key positions in government and run for elected office. She helped plant and position young and youngish men and women, most from diverse backgrounds by phony officials, using her down-home charm and love with laughter to introduce one of her young friends. She would call us to check on how we were doing and in return, she wanted to hear the latest political gossip, many times generating laughs when she would start a sentence with, can you believe they're doing this? Why would they do that? My first job out of college was a token affirmative action hire. The state licensing agency had one affirmative action position in an all white agency. I was that one. I sat behind a desk with nothing to do. I quit after a month with my ego diminished and with a resolve of never allowing myself to be used as a token ever again. Next stops were good jobs with the Tacoma Human Relations Agency, then the Tacoma Bilingual Education Technical Assistance Center good jobs that deepened my understanding of discrimination and racism, individual, structural, and institutional racism. Now remember, I came from a country as a young immigrant, totally unaware of the concept of racism. I continued to be active in the community, especially the Asian American Alliance, where idealist young peers were dreaming and struggling to make a small nonprofit do more in providing social services to the Asian American community, this time serving mixed race families because of the presence of two large military bases in the area. When Vietnam fell, our small nonprofit were among those who welcomed Vietnamese refugees when they landed. We helped process them and we helped them as they were released to host churches and families. But career-wise, I stayed restless and searched for more with not, without really knowing what I was searching for. When you are young, smart, and engaged, everyone else has a vision of who you are. I didn't know who I was yet. I had feelings and instincts that I could do more, experience more. So it was that I competed successfully to be a National Urban Fellow and landed me in a placement with the director of the US Office of Personnel Management. And at the same time, in a master's program at Bucknell University. The Asian American movement was small in Washington, DC because there were very, very few Asians. And it was decidedly dull compared to my experiences in Seattle and Tacoma back in Washington state. But I did meet Juanita Tamayo Lott, a California transplant, a Filipino American woman who worked for the US Census and was busy organizing federal Asian American employees into doing more with policies from within. For the first time, I also met someone who specifically mentored me for my career. Officially assigned to the OPM secretary, 
I was seconded to Joanne Jors, a Polish American Catholic woman who was direct, overtly ambitious and unashamed to show how smart she was. She took me under her wing because she had served in the Peace Corps in the Philippines. She loved it there and she maintained a circle of friends who had done similar service. My Asian American activities were fine, but of no interest to her. It was all about me, the potential that she saw for management and leadership. She encouraged me in thinking about how I use my fellowship for the next career step. She asked questions I had no answers for. What size of fish do I want to be? Do I want to grow to be a big fish in a big pond, meaning Washington, DC, or a big fish in a small pond like Seattle? I will say that both women stayed in my life for many years. While I have lost Joanne, Juanita continues to be my friend today. Ultimately, I chose Seattle because I wanted to be back in my own pulsating community that is asserting itself over issues of discrimination in education, employment, housing, and human services. My return to Seattle was an easy fit as I got drawn to the Asian American Women's Caucus where we were finding and exercising our voices, asserting our place as women leaders in our community, declaring that Lotus Blossom does not live here anymore. We were mostly peers and it was exciting to feel that we mattered, that Asian American women had issues distinct and apart from those same issues in education, employment, housing, and human services that affected everyone else. That caucus cemented friendships and relationships that endure despite time and separate lives. I connected again with Ruth Wu, and really became part of her extended clan and web of community high potentials. As a second generation Japanese American, she had experienced the internment camps when whole families of Japanese ancestry were swept up and placed in internment camps, desolate and isolated prison communities merely because of their race because surely, because they were of Japanese ancestry, they would betray the US during World War II. I continued to learn from Ruth how to understand, how to use influence and leverage whatever job I held to help my community. These acts range from simple things like adding the names of ethnic newspapers to lists of media that the city could consider for advertising, to joining employee and affinity groups, to providing information to the community members, community leaders on how processes worked and who beyond elected officials could help move some of our issues. Through Ruth and my growing networks, I moved up the management ladder in communications, community development, and economic development. I was appointed to exempt positions, and when I lost a job because the Republican governor retired and a Democratic governor was elected, I was resurrected in a different department with a better job, again, thanks to the Ruth and the network. I was beginning to mature in management and relishing my community life when I finally met my love and life partner, Dione Dionisio. I had a daily hour long commute between the state capital and Seattle and little social life in between. But occasionally I dropped in on a pickup volleyball game among activists at the Buddhist temple. 
there was a range of abilities and competitiveness, competitiveness with me at the awful end of the spectrum. One of the guys spiked the ball hard directly at me at one time. It was a painful hit. I was so mad and Viotti sheepishly apologized. Later on, he admitted he wanted to make an impression because he thought there were other guys who liked me. It was quite an impression, negative in the beginning, but today we are still together. Still, I wasn't ready to settle. For years, I had gravitated towards New York and its excitement. I loved my community and had fallen in love with Yoni, but internally, I still felt there had to be more, that I was missing out on something. So I moved and landed a job with the Community Service Society of New York, a nonprofit with roots way back to the 1800s, starting a social service agency in the Lower East Side, serving poor Europeans to become a large human services research and advocacy organization focused on poverty, and this time on the Black and Latin American communities. This was the 1980s, and AIDS was the epidemic. It was unknown and frightening. CSS focused on the victims of color, their families and children. It started a grandmother's group who would go into hospital wards to cradle and rock babies with AIDS. CSS was also a key player in educating and empowering the Black and Latino communities on the power of the vote at all levels. I was their communications director, the only Asian in management. It was the first time that I also experienced inter-race discrimination and hate. At that time, Koreans were opening small grocery stores in poor Black neighborhoods. They were distrusted as interlopers and as gentrifiers and economic warlords. I was assigned to cover many rallies in my role. And one time I was assigned to cover a Brooklyn rally at the house of the Lord Church to get out the vote. The mostly black attendees barred me from entering, suspicious that I had a camera. One of my colleagues spotted me vouching for my admittance, arguing that if I was a spy, I would look like one of them and not look Chinese. So even my colleague did not know the difference between a Chinese and a Filipino. But that particular day yielded my best work treasure. I was one of several photographers, but from the church rafters, I was able to photograph Rosa Parks, surrounded by church, union, and government officials. The reverence for Rosa Parks permeated the entire church. That photograph accompanies me even today as I look at it directly across my desk and always feel I always feel that I have a place and a role to play in uplifting communities. I was in New York for two years when the time came to be with Yoni. After years of massive phone calls, remember this was the 80s, long before cell phones and unlimited plans, the choice was to live in bustling New York, but crammed in a studio or return to moderately exciting Seattle, but be able to live in the house. So Seattle it was. Back in Seattle, after leading communications for a major nonprofit in New York, I made a deliberate choice to get into leadership in a more technical department and move away from leading soft services. Public utilities are notoriously impervious to outsiders. Breaking into this world was like taking on a fortress. 
My network had limited impact, but I persisted. I made a choice to take a sidestep as an assistant to the top executive of the Seattle Water Department, where I was able to rise up the ladder again. It turned out to be a great strategic choice. As the only woman of color in management, I became the one woman strike force for the superintendent in addressing labor and tribal issues while being responsive to the mayor and city council. Hiring, training, and retaining women in non-traditional jobs like water pipe workers resulted in labor unrest and pushback from the men who traditionally held these positions. The Muckleshoot tribe was asserting its traditional rights to access the Cedar River watershed as its hunting, gathering, and worship grounds. In a seven year period, I was promoted many times, directing programs that included the 50 year strategic planning, rate setting, managing water dams, working with regulators, and managing complex community engagement on contentious issues. Getting agreements in these areas were nearly impossible until we adjusted our mindset to grudging yeses as a win. We had to accept that there will always be fierce opponents to any utility issue because of rates and environmental impacts. Gaining to a grudging yes meant enough people could support the benefits of any project or issue for us to get approval from the mayor and city council. Though each reorganization placed me in a better directorship position, I hit the glass ceiling a couple of times in my bids to head my own city department. I was too young. I was too terse. My kids were too young. I was too good at being in the second tier of leadership the department head would suffer if I left that department. Very discouraging messages to hear especially when the messages did not come directly from the people who were giving it. You know, I would get it indirectly from others. But then the classic, when the door closes, a window opens happened. Seattle is a sister city to Surabaya, Indonesia. Surabaya received loans from the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to expand potable water service to 80% of its population. A condition of the World Bank loan was to learn utility standards in an advanced country. No one at Seattle Water wanted the inconvenience of hosting the visiting delegation. Everyone looked at me, the one Asian in management, actually the one person of color in management, to host the Surabaya delegation for over a month to learn how Seattle provides water service. Curiously, the delegation was headed by a woman engineer, which is unusual for a Muslim country. A year later, I was invited to be her strategic development advisor and serve as the liaison to the World Bank. That engagement moved my young family to Indonesia from 1995 to 1998. The project also hired Dioni to be an advisor using his construction background for large segments of the project. I learned to be functional enough to do presentations in Bahasa Indonesia, but the true value of that experience was learning in how to succeed in the world that was more rigid and protocol, where women were clearly treated with honor, yet disparate place in society, and were finding the balance in advising a regional government within a highly centralized national government was key. That engagement was abruptly cut by the downfall of President Suharto's government. The 1997 Asian financial crisis led to rioting in the streets and the burning of buildings, banks, churches, and commercial areas. 
Suharto's 30-year grip on power weakened and his government fell. The United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, and France evacuated all of their citizens. Though we were invited back to the project, we decided to stay in Seattle because of our young kids and the ongoing stability in Indonesia. Culture shock, of course, hit my family when we returned to Seattle. Too many choices, too much freedom compared to Surabaya, Indonesia. There was hardly any traffic and that traffic that existed was orderly. From living in a city with millions of people to living in Seattle with hundreds of thousands of people, we had to adjust back to less crowds and having more personal space. My networks quickly came into play again and I became the assistant director in charge of Seattle's comprehensive planning for growth management and neighborhood planning. The art of politics and not in my backyard, NIMBY, roared hot and fast when it came to where to place and where not to place growth. Property owners, renters, developers, businesses, churches, random groups, all had special interests and competing visions for their neighborhoods and the entire city. It was head spinning to move from the rigid processes of Indonesia to the come one, come all fracas of city planning. The mayor was visionary, but became one term when in 1999, over 40,000 protesters converged in Seattle from around the world to protest the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference. Days of fighting between protesters and police doomed Shell's political future. A new mayor was elected, and though I loved government work and effect, felt effective in it, the Seattle politics was mired in process and more process, and it was getting uglier. The macabre joke was Seattle's biggest product is process. Strife and gridlock became the norm. Though the opportunity to lead another department became possible after serving two governors and four mayors, I left government to refresh, to be more present to my two fierce preteen daughters and to help care for my sick father. I had gravitated back to the community while at a Martin Luther, Luther King Day March in 2003, I happened to be next to Sharon Maeda, founder of a small consulting firm. Specker chose only projects that gave purpose, joy, and uplifted communities. That fateful day led to my becoming a Specter principal, which eventually led me back to international community health services. We were contracted to do strategic planning, but after leadership interviews and finding that they had no needs assessment nor an organizational capacity review, I respectfully presented my preliminary thoughts to the board president and we both agreed that the timing was not right for a strategic plan. I briefly returned to city government to help David Della, newly elected Seattle city council member, to establish his office. He was only the second Filipino American to be elected to the Seattle City Council, and he invited me to serve as his chief of staff. I could not say no, as he is best buddy to my husband. However, not wanting to be in the mix of brutal city politics again, I agreed to only serve six months to set up his legislative agenda, organize his office, and find my replacement. The issues were exciting and the insider game to fix problems in the neighborhoods were exhilarating, but I felt the burnout creeping back. Within a few months, ICHS executive director asked if I would consider helping her with two big projects, opening ICHS new second clinic at Holly Park and going live with ICHS first electronic health record system. Still trying to gauge my next career step, I thought, no problem. 
I've done these types of projects. I've been part of major capital projects and electronic records conversions in the city. I could do six months, but once aboard, my work ballooned to include troubleshooting the dental and pharmacy programs while closing down defunded programs. I was vacuumed deep into operations beyond the initial engagement. We agreed to a three month extension, but while I was already planning on how to exit ICHS, the executive director announced her resignation, citing extreme burnout and needing the time to refresh. Instead of leaving ICHS, I was named interim executive director in 2005. When I first became the strategic planning consultant for ICHS in 2003, I expected a small storefront clinic, the clinic that was seared in my memory when it was just starting up in the 70s. I was surprised to find a thriving clinic with 200 staff and two sites. Founded in 1973, the International District Clinic, uh, its name before it became International Community Health Services, that clinic struggled financially to stay open for its first 20 years, chasing grants and dependent on donations. But before I joined ICHS, Many things had already begun to change in the healthcare landscape. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president and slashed many social and health services programs. All these programs were critical to the ID clinic for survival. But Washington state stepped up and filled the care gap when it established a pilot basic health plan in the late 80s, providing subsidized manage care coverage to individuals and families up to 200% of the federal poverty level. Health centers around the state formed the community health plan after commercial insurance companies refused to contract with them. With the basic health plan, ICH has moved to successfully enroll as many patients as it could. And with enrollment came reimbursement, with reimbursement came the opportunity to grow and the opportunity to become a federally qualified health center, which assured that it would have a base grant for uninsured patients and assured that it could have payment for wraparound services and assured that it could get federal coverage for malpractice if it met the standards for a federally qualified health center. I was appointed executive director in 2006 and immediately began to visit and talk to the staff who were very committed and very much interested and invested in serving the community. My challenge was to bring order to the non-clinic side, build a solid foundation for the, the clinic lead a community needs assessment that told us where our patients and where our communities were. And we learned that we had to build new sites because the housing costs had forced many of our communities outside of Seattle. We needed to be where they were. All of the different jobs I had led me to ICHS and helped prepare me for leading it. I'm very grateful that I've had a very strong board and a talented staff committed to providing high quality, affordable, culturally and linguistically appropriate care. We have had barriers to break down, recessions and economic challenges to weather, hostile government leadership to survive, but through it all, our team have managed to grow services to serve more diverse speaking populations, including those who speak 70 different languages. We have managed to win numerous quality awards and be recognized as an organization that feistly fights for health equity. Leading ICHS has been the biggest gift to me. And as I look forward to retirement at the end of the year, I'm excited for my next chapter and even more thrilled for the next ascendant leader at ICHS because today's issues 
are even more urgent, even more in our faces as we try to find a different normal with COVID and with racism, anti-Asian hate, mental health challenges, access to the culturally appropriate and competent care. So we try to find economic opportunities for members of our community as we advocate for disaggregation of data because Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders cover a multitude of cultures, ethnicities, countries of origin, religions, and many more differences. That nomenclature, the effort to put one label on all of our peoples has hurt us because the perception of a monolith, of a model minority is not true across the board. We have to fight for funding of programs, especially those like community health centers who focus on serving those who need us most. I urge you to know your history beyond Ancestry.com. They say if you know history, then you don't have to repeat it. We know that history repeats itself. Back during the height of the civil rights movement, many leaders thought if we legislated, regulated, prohibited racism, sexism, ageism, anti-LGBTQ, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, anti-people with disabilities, and many more antis that indeed discrimination will no longer happen. But it continues to happen and has gotten uglier and more violent. I urge you to cultivate relationships and friendships to find your commonality with people with common values. Trust has to be built and it happens one positive experience at a time, large or small, until you have that foundation. I've been around long enough that when I see people I have not seen in a long time, if that trust is there, if that reservoir of goodwill is there, they can ask me for most anything and in turn, I can ask them for most anything. My gym has this Mahatma Gandhi quote, strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will. Strength comes from both. Until our country gets to a place where all people are honored, respected, enjoy open opportunities and have choice. We all have a responsibility to show up, listen to others, learn from others, experience with others, stand up, Maybe your voice is just beginning to gain strength, but begin speaking out. Begin speaking with friends in small circles. Build that muscle and confidence. Speak out, whatever your medium, speak out against injustice and inequality. Thank you for your kindness and grace. Thank you for your words. Um sharing your journey, your words of, of wisdom that apply in so many ways to so many individuals who are um, joining together in this um, struggle towards equity and towards justice and towards inclusion. And you gave us wonderful examples. What I'd like to do is to introduce our um, panelists. And for you to join as we're thinking about the questions there, if that's all right with you, um, because I think it's a time for all of us to share. And you set such a, a wonderful um, place for us to begin our, our sort of shared conver conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce the panelists and then um, move back to, to, to questions for all of us. We have uh, panelists include Dr. Monica Burrell, Senior Advisor to Mayor of Boston, who was appointed by Mayor Wu to lead the city's response to the humanitarian crisis 
in the area in Boston that we know as MassCAS. And in this capacity, she oversees public health equity-led approach focused on individual medical treatment needs with a focus on building an intermediate and long-term plan to address the intersecting issues of homelessness, substance use disorder, and mental health. She was formerly the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, and in that role, she led the state's aggressive response to the opioid crisis. Um, and her work was very much dedicated to addressing issues of health disparity and leading the effort around COVID-19. Um, Dr. Kelly uh, June joins us as Chief Equity Officer at the MGH Institute of Health Professionals and an adjunct lecturer on the education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. That MGH IHP is the only degree granting institution within the Mass General Brigham system, where Dr. June is also a member of the MGB Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. She's also founder and principal of XEM Consulting Services. Um, and has won many awards and recognitions for her leadership in the DEI space, most recently from Get Connected, as well as Color, uh, among other places. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Wong is a board certified pediatric dermatologist at Boston Children's Hospital and associate professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. Um, she serves as chief, uh, section chief of dermatology at Children's and as the program director of the Harvard Combined Dermatology Residency Training Program. Uh, and also holds a clinical appointment at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute where she specializes in pediatric oncodermatology uh, with um, clinical research interests that cover graft versus host disease, skin cancer, childhood cancer. Um, and then Ms. Priya Bathija is Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the American Hospital Association. And in that role, she leads AHA's efforts to guide hospitals as they promote value and affordability by implementing strategies that improve outcomes, lower costs, and enhance patient experiences. And she leads the organization's work on maternal and child health, social determinants, and is a member of the AHA's Health Equity Strategies team. Um, what I'd like is for each of you sort of in order, I mentioned your, your sort, of, sort of current title and role, but maybe you could tell us um, briefly about that role and how it has enabled you or enables you to address issues of health equity and maybe even borrowing from some of the lessons that we heard um, in our keynote address. And I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Burrell. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Reed. Um, just a simple pleasure to be with all of these wonderful um, speakers, panelists, and thank you for that um, incredible um, perspective in the keynote about, um, you know, to me, it highlighted how important um, history is, how important each of our individual and collective histories are, and how that shapes everything we do, and then how we can use that to really make powerful um, change in our environments and policies. Really appreciative to be with you. Um, as you mentioned, I'm currently the senior advisor to uh, Mayor Wu, working on issues related to homelessness, mental health, and substance use. And you know, pertinent to the topic we're um, talking about now, um, one of the reasons I came to take this um, position was because of the what it meant to historically have Mayor Wu um, leading the city of Boston with multiple firsts that she represents, including the first. Um, female, the first um, person of color, the first person who's AAPI. So thrilled to be working for her. And it was her leadership that drew, drew me here um, because she um, wanted to do something differently and do something transformative and look at things differently in area that, areas that I've worked in for a long time. And we're working with issues related to um, homelessness. Um, it's an area, those of us who um, experience homelessness are, um, really at a place where any inequities that existed already are highlighted and where you can see all of the fractures and cracks in our society and where things need to be addressed most. So it's an area where um, the health equity pieces um, are obvious of um, what the needs are and um, where the systems have failed. And when you see people living in um, tents as we had in Boston, 
um, across the state from a shelter down the road from a leading academic medical center and surrounded by services. Um, it's a real symptom of ways in which we have failed um, some members of our community and we've worked really hard over the last six months to create with them. So uh, with the individuals who are staying in the tents, hearing their voice and finding viable options for places where they can um, uh, begin a uh, road to treatment, recovery, and housing. And, you know, part of even in that work, which is really embedded in health equity, one of the lessons for me um, has been, especially from COVID, that we must be intentional about working towards equity and about making sure that in our policies and programs that they're addressed from the beginning. Because otherwise, as we heard also examples from the keynote, there can be unintended consequences of our policies if we don't think about it from the start. So after COVID, I have given myself um, um, an imperative that I must, any work I do, I have to start with health equity from the beginning, not as an add-on. So for example, in this work, we started um, in the beginning tracking um, individuals' demographics, including race and ethnicity, to make sure that as we move people into programs, we were doing it in a fair and equitable and just way. Um, the other thing I want to um, mention about my um, recent career is um, related to running the Department of Health for almost seven years, and specifically around the pandemic. So many of us in the field of health equity have been aware of the issues that individuals face and the struggles that individuals have in accessing services, including health services. Um, but the pandemic highlighted that for a broader audience and unfortunately really showed, again, the chasms in our society and those of us who most suffer um, from um, inequities. And one of the things I wanted to highlight in relation to this discussion is we did, as part of the Department of Public Health work, we did a community survey early on in the pandemic in September through November of 2020. Um, and we interviewed um, qualitatively and quantitatively 35,000 individuals and overrepresented for individuals who aren't often um, surveyed. And that included an overrepresentation by 5X of individuals within the AAPI community. And within that, we did um, um, a very um, focused, um, focused, we took AAPIs being the diverse community that, of individuals that we are, we then further desegregated um, um, information so that um, it would be by specific groups of us. So Indians versus Cambodia versus Khmer versus Vietnamese, et cetera. And um, I can put the link in if anybody would like to see the information. But the bottom line is that even within AAPI, we were able to show differences. Like for example, those who had been discriminated against um, related to COVID. Um, and the specific types of discrimination and how that impacted the community. So I raise that to say there are so many ways um, that in this work, we can take um, equity and health equity and then further be more sophisticated about the way we talk about data and the way we then implement change um, and think about that work. So looking forward to hearing from others as well. Thank you. Thank you. That's the importance of disaggregation and not making assumptions that we all have the same shared experience and same shared outcomes. So thank you for that. Dr. Jun. Sure. Um, my title is Chief Equity Officer at MGH Institute of Health Professions. It's um, the only degree granting institution within the Master General Brigham system. And our mission is to advance care in a diverse society through leadership, education, um, clinical practice, research, and community engagement. And so my office um, back in 2020, we've rebranded from DEI to JEDI. There's a distinct difference to make sure that everybody understood that we were leading with justice and equity. We also have a commitment to equity and anti-oppression. And within that, there's data equity and we're disaggregating data as well. Um, but a lot of our work is capacity building and targeted support for marginalized and minoritized members of our community. We engage in conversations about um, anti-Asian racism, anti-Black racism. Um, and we also, we have this distinct program called Power, Privilege and Positionality, which is an orientation program for all of our students, but it's also required for faculty and staff. Um, and this orientation program really helps people, um, the graduates of the program, to have a solid foundational knowledge of systemic racism and other forms of oppression, um, how they produce health disparities, and for our students too, to, and faculty to think about their roles as healthcare providers in providing patient-centered care, um, holistic support, being able to listen to their patients um, as their patients are 
be experts of their own um, own bodies and their own lived experiences, right? So a lot of this is knowledge building and skills building to be able to um, think about how we engage in health equity as healthcare providers. Thank you. Dr. Wong. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Jen Huang. Um, it is, I'm incredibly humbled to be invited to serve on this panel with all of these really accomplished women. Um, and um, really, I, when I was invited, I felt like I wasn't sure if I had anything to say that would be different than, or even you know, as valuable as what other people um, have. But I thought a lot about um, some of these issues and um, we'll speak to it maybe later, but wanted to first introduce myself. So I'm a pediatric dermatologist. I work at Boston Children's Hospital. I've been here since 2010. Um, this is my fifth year as program director for the Harvard Combined Dermatology Residency Program. And since September of this past year, I took on the position of section chief for dermatology at Children's. And I love my jobs. Um, it, it's a lot of work. And I will say just in this space of the topics that we're talking about, um, I have felt like I am in a profession and in a specialty of privilege um, and being able to be in a position where I can create opportunities and instill values in younger generations of physicians and improve access for everybody um, and really debunk the myth that dermatology is a specialty of privilege and that everyone should have access to it um, by creating um, you know, access models for care, um, create um, in our dermatology residency. I'm very proud that we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that really just gathered people that were engaged and ready, ready to do the work um, and really wanting to change how people perceive the specialty and how we improve access for everybody. Um, that has been really the best thing about my position, being able to provide opportunities for others to do the work and elevate um, their voices. And so um, I, I feel like, you know, that's been kind of the unique perspective that I've had in these roles. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Baptija. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for including me on this panel today. Um, so honored to be here with all of you and excited to talk about some of these topics that we have on the agenda for today. Um, so I am Priya Bhatija, as I was introduced in my current role is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the American Hospital Association. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, AHA is a national organization that represents hospitals and health systems. Our membership includes nearly 5,000 hospitals, health systems, networks, and other providers of care, um, as well as 43,000 individual members. And we do two things for our members. Um, we represent and advocate for them um, to ensure that their perspectives and needs are addressed at the federal level. Um, and we also provide education for healthcare leaders to guide them on key issues and prepare them for the changing healthcare landscape. So my current job, even though I've held a couple roles at the American Hospital Association, my current role is in that second arena. And I lead our work on value, affordability, maternal and child health, and the societal factors that influence health. Um, and each of these issues is directly tied to health equity. Um, for example, addressing the societal factors, whether it's through meeting an individual patient's social needs for housing or food security, um, or addressing the broader social determinants of health within a community, those are just one strategy to help improve health equity. Um, or our focus on maternal and child health um, has been to reduce disparities that lead to increased maternal mortality and morbidity um, for Black and American Indian Alaska Native women, um, who, as many of you may know, are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. So my team's goal is to develop tools, resources, and education in all of these areas so that we can begin to drive hospitals to where they need to be in terms of healthcare delivery and improving health for individuals and their communities. Um, so as Monica mentioned, that includes helping them be intentional about their efforts, helping them understand how to build resources and the capacity necessary to take on this work. Um, it also helps, um, it also includes helping them learn how to partner 
um, because as we tell our hospitals and health systems often, um, no one stakeholder can take on all of this work of health equity. Um, because the reality is we have limited resources and capabilities, um, and many of the inequities we are solving for um, stem from systemic or multidimensional and multi-stakeholder problems that we need to um, all be solving together. Um, so there are times when hospitals should be leading, but there are times when hospitals um, should be partners and helping in other ways um, by providing resources, serving as a convener, um, many other ways, but um, we do um, try to help our hospitals understand that um, this is a team effort as we move forward with health equity. Thank you. Um, I'm struck, I was struck in uh, Dr. Um, Ms. Batiola's presentation about how this theme of what, what she called as barrier breakers, but she also talked about mentors and building a network. Um, and I was struck about this by this concept of how often we find ourselves one, the only one, where she found herself the only one in multiple places. I'm assuming some of the other panelists have found themselves at time as being the only one of whatever that identity might be. But um, I'm gonna turn to you first, uh, Ms. Batiola, to, to help us understand a little bit more about this concept of, of these barrier breakers or these mentor sponsors and, and the importance of building a network. And what does that mean for someone who's a woman and um, Asian American Pacific Islander? Are there some specific issues that we should be taking into consideration or thinking about in this space? Searching for people who are like us, whether that is in our physical form or share our values or share the way we think is always a challenge. And I think for someone who you know immigrated to this country and who really did not know where to look, and I think this would be equal to anybody moving to a new environment, um, it's trying to find those places where those people gather, where people you identify with gather. And sometimes they are in libraries, sometimes in community centers, sometimes in political meetings, sometimes in churches, you know, any natural gathering place and just starting to meet people. Uh, I think that is so important because until you start to connect and to figure out, you know, your values and how they are consistent with others' value and begin to build your own community. And sometimes it's one or two people at a time. Uh, it is hard to really extend how you are as a person and how you can contribute and assist. But bottom line to that is going beyond our isolated selves. Thank you. I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Dr. Jun, next. And maybe if you can expand on this some in terms of, I know you have leadership programs and you've talked about this capacity building, et cetera. What does it mean in this space? I, I know for myself, when I think about the academic medicine in the world where I live, where Asians are not underrepresented, but Asians in leadership are underrepresented. And AAPI women in leadership are even more underrepresented. Um, what is the role or is there a role for this mentoring and sponsorship and, and this network building? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, so in terms of just the research out there, like you had mentioned, um, Dr. Reed, that um, AAPI women are severely underrepresented in leadership positions, right? So when we look at college presidents, only 3% of college presidents are women, half of 1% are AAPI women. And then when you look at endowed professorships in um, education as well too, 1.1% are AAPI women. And so um, like we are often the one or one of a few um, in any spaces. And I found that even through navigating my own graduate experiences, I had to create these spaces on my own, right? So when I went to conferences and saw how um, there were a lot of black scholars and students who all knew each other, we didn't have that space for AAPI. So I um, co-created a space called the Support Network for um, Asian Pacific Scholars in Higher Education, SNAPS. And um, we often find that we do have to 
either try to plug into an existing network that might be um, much more broad. We have to find mentors that might not necessarily be API women, right? They could also be women of color. And um, I found one of my greatest mentors is um, Dr. Bridget Terry Long when I was a master's student at Harvard. And um, she was my supervisor, she was my advisor, and we just connected. And I know that there was a question about how do you find mentorship, right? A lot of it is informal. There are also formal networks that folks could try to plug into. Um, I think uh, in terms of institutions and establishing these types of programs, um, I think they have to acknowledge that API women are underrepresented in some way. And most of the time, like they're given, we're given messages that programs are not open to us because we're perceived as overrepresented. And I think that's where the data disaggregation is really important to show. Um, I identify as a first gen student. Um, I came from a low income background. My family has a history of being unhoused. And I was often told like, oh, you can't, um, participate in these programs because you're overrepresented. Asian Americans are overrepresented. So the first thing for organizations is to, and institutions is to, to recognize that there is underrepresentation of AAPI women, to look at the data that we have, disaggregate that data, and then develop targeted supports for um, marginalized and minoritized populations, right? So AAPI women, uh, women of color, um, trans folks, uh, folks with disabilities as well too. So just thinking about all of that, um, because I think when we think about it in isolation, we don't think about how all of our struggles are are interconnected. Um, so, yeah. That the interconnections, the intersections that we all have across these groups and underrepresentation. Dr. Wong. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in terms of this issue, I mean, you're leading a training program. Um, and, and really looking at preparing this sort of next generation of clinicians and dermatologists. And, um, and, and we've just heard from Dr. Uh, June about the role of institutions in terms of how to think about this. What is there a role for mentoring and building networks um, to, to increase the representation, representation of AAPI women um, in the academy? Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And um, just to kind of amplify what um, Kimberly was saying, uh, I was thinking about how much we internalize, and I'm just gonna say, maybe I'll just say I'll, I internalize as an Asian American in terms of being told that we don't belong in a vulnerable group or we aren't marginalized. Um, and in, on top of that, thinking about um, how much we've internalized the model minority myth um, and how I think that whether it's conscious or subconscious, we are told to that we should be grateful for the opportunities that we've had and that we are overrepresented in at least, you know, as physicians. And, and I think, I just wonder sometimes how much that becomes internalized and therefore there isn't as much effort either by the self or by the group to form a strong community. Um, and as I self-reflected on that um, in thinking about younger generations, um, as I mentioned before, I had done I have done a lot of work around diversity, equity, and inclusion within our dermatology residency, mostly focused around groups that are underrepresented in medicine. Um, and uh, maybe a month ago, we had an anonymous feedback survey about inclusion and belonging. And um, within our residency program, about 25% of our residents identify as Asian American. And there was a comment about how a resident felt that they, were often mistaken um, by mistaken as a different Asian American resident, and why can't people get their names straight, and why aren't we doing anything about it? And that really hit home for me because I realized that I was advocating for groups that need advocacy, but I was actually not really even thinking about a group that I identified with, and. Um, I was embarrassed and I continue to think about that. And I think especially when I was invited to participate in that, I thought in this made me really think about the mentorship and sponsor sponsorship that is needed amongst us because there is a bottleneck and that we aren't, um, many of us are not making it to leadership roles. Um, and just before, just one quick kind of data point on that in dermatology, 
um, 20 to 25 percent of dermatology applicants identify as Asian American. And as I was looking at leaders in dermatology, there are only four chairs of dermatology who are AAPI women and only seven program directors in dermatology who are AAPI women. So there's clearly, you know, an issue that I personally feel like I have not led, even as, you know, being a diversity champion in our specialty. Thank you. Um, Dr. Borrell, as you, you think about this and you, you have worked uh, now at the, sort of in the city level, you've worked at the state level in the space, uh, you worked um, healthcare for the homeless, you've worked in the, in the community level and not for profit space. Um, this role of mentorship, and, and I'm hearing that there is a need for more representation of AAPI women. Um, what do you think could or should be done? And is there a role, as Dr. Wong has just talked about, or AAPI women to step in and take the lead in helping expand the conversation about increasing diversity, making it more broad and more inclusive. Yeah, I think that a couple of things I'll, I'll notice and say, I mean, you know, when we talk about inclusion versus, so there's inclusion of all of us feeling included and represented and valued in the work we do. And then there's the equity piece, which we're talking about kind of both together and the equity and the, the health inequities that from my own work I see and address um, are with multiple different groups, right? And there's a way to come together around that. Um, the inclusion piece that we're talking about now, I think has different layers and different, so I'm just gonna separate those for a minute to talk about them. And the inclusion piece I separate out for a couple of reasons. So number one, um, you know, so I came from, whether it was, as you said, community-based or in academic medical centers, um, perceived as overrepresented in my field, right, of medicine. I'm an internal medicine physician. And yet, I think what that discounts, which I think um, Jennifer is getting at a little bit, is that even within those roles, there can be aggressions, microaggressions, or more blatant ones that are felt and need to be um, understood and heard and addressed. So, you know, I think that's an important piece we, we should think about that um, even for those who are overrepresented, um, there are issues that come up that should not be addressed, especially as a woman, an AAPI woman, there is a stereotype that is so profoundly um, 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 believed around, you know, um, what we should be and what our role should be. And when you step out of that, so when I would, if I would have to step out of the meek, obedient, you know, resident who's doing the work to tr trying to, to, not trying to taking leadership roles, that is seen as different. And then moving into government, um, in government leadership, they're very, very, we're very underrepresented as female AAPI. And in government, uh, not, I just told you about this wonderful role model in Mayor Wu, but um, at the state level, you know, there are times when it's extremely isolating and finding that um, camaraderie and mentorship actually can't even come from, an, you know, say for example, an AAPI woman, it comes from other people who have felt other. And some of my strongest allies and when I was at the Department of Public Health were, for example, Black women, because we had felt other in a way that doesn't have to be exactly the same, but we can come together and relate. Um, and then also finding ways to find mentors who are actually part of the majority group and have them understand and become allies. Uh, you know, you need that because the people who are in power, um, having them appreciate what the issues are and then ally around um, to me, it's been more about with people understanding that, you know, there's many ways in which I'm actually more similar to them than whatever stereotype they put me on that, you know, it's okay that I like the Celtics or that I want to talk things beyond health and advocate for things beyond that, right? So I think that's part of it as well as, um, you know, how we think about mentor, I think all of us mentoring, but also being mentored and, and who, that, who that can encompass and how wide that might have to be and should be. Thank you. I see, uh, uh, let me see, um, Ms. Patioli, your hand is up. And then I want also for um, Ms. Patija to also answer this, but let's start with you, Ms. Patiola. Well, I think this is a really engaging piece and I like what Kimberly said in terms of when she couldn't find anybody, she started her own. Uh, but I also truly believe uh, what Monica was saying in terms of Sometimes you have to find a conglomeration of people. And I also think that 
I, you know, while I was extremely lucky to find powerful me women who were interested in me and who were also, uh, who also became my friends over time, I only named two people. I think that we have different needs where we are in our point, in our careers, in our to total lives. And, you know, the, this myth of trying to find one mentor is just not true. And uh, I have to say again, you know, because I have enjoyed the benefits of it, if they can become your friend, if you have a relationship with them, that is even more valuable because years later, even if you have not seen each other, that connection is still there and the value of that friendship lasts with you a lifetime. I will say that I have been invited many times to be a mentor in these formal tables. And while I have served a specific time, like, you know, mentor somebody for three months, six months, it hasn't lasted. Not a single one of those relationships has lasted because it was very transactional. And what I am encouraging you to do, everybody in this group to do is get beyond this transaction, get to know the person, establish a real relationship, and it will last you far longer than when you need the mentoring. Thank you. Ms. Bethesia. Yeah, and I guess I would just like to build on that point. Um, I think being a mentor, building a network, finding mentors, finding sponsors, I think it all comes down to how you can help other people, right? So each relationship that you're in, is how can you build a long lasting relationship that is focused on helping each other succeed, not just a transaction. So I actually have had the good fortune of being part of mentorship programs where I have now had the same mentor for 18 to 20 years, right? Because we have both come to the relationship with that understanding that we want to help each other succeed and do better. Um, and this is so important. I mean, prior to me being in the healthcare space and working at the American Hospital Association, I was a lawyer. Um, and the legal department is, you know, the legal world, sorry, not a department, um, you know, is, there is also an underrepresentation of Asians and other people of color in that profession. And then to come into healthcare and see so many healthcare workers be Asian, but so few of them rise to leadership roles. It, it makes you wonder and question sort of how, how do we make that change and how do we make that jump to getting women that look like all of the women on this panel into those leadership roles at the C-suite and um, CEO level. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations at the AHA with hospital leaders on, on how can we do that, not just for Asian Americans, but for Black Americans, for Latino Americans. How do we do that? Um, and I think just, you know, I'll touch briefly because other speakers have already mentioned it. One's path is creating those formal mechanisms and those formal training programs and then encouraging people that look like the hospital's patients and populations and workforce to actually be in those programs because those programs are not helpful if you build them and only fill them with white individuals, right? So how do we build those programs and then make sure the right people are signing up to do that from a leadership perspective? And then from an individual perspective, we've got to raise our hands to be part of those programs. We've got to show up and take advantage of them because I think there are times when we allow the experiences we've had, whether it's cultural or in past employment, um, keep us from signing up and raising our hands. And I think that doing that is really important. And then last, I'll just say, I think when you don't have those formal programs, finding ways to find mentors and sponsorships can be challenging. But today we have a lot more going for us than 10 years ago, 15 years ago. There are so many organizations that can help you build relationships that will help you succeed in the future. So just from my personal experience, I've been very involved with the South Asian Bar Association, the um, Asian Bar Association. There is a group of, it's called the Association of Asian Healthcare Leaders that has been created. Um, all of those are avenues to help find not only mentors or sponsors, but like-minded individuals who have the same lived experiences, who understand where we're coming from, who may also be the first lawyer or healthcare executive in their family. So sharing that experience and coming together in that way can be really beneficial as well. Thank you. We're, we're nearing the end, but I want to, to raise a, a last question because I think 
given what has been said and given the times that we're in, um, which are interesting times, I'll put it that way. Um, and for anyone to answer this or give your thoughts on it, I don't know if any of us has the final answer. Um, should there be, or is there a role for AAPI leaders as we think about racism and anti-racism? And I'm just putting this out um, for anyone that wants to speak up. I'll jump in. Of course, there is a role. One of the bigger roles that we have is internally looking at ourselves because we have been put in this banner of whether you say AAPI or a and HPI of being the same peoples. We come from different origins. Many times the countries we came from don't even like each other or have been at war with each other. And we are expected to be here and all of a sudden we're one people. So an internal you know, effort to take a look at inter and intra racism. There are a lot of skin-based color prejudices in many of our cultures. So taking a look at that and taking a look at how it affects our relationships with black people, with brown people, with other people of colors. Uh, we have a lot of other barriers about LGBTQ uh, and, and so how they are in our cultures of origin or home countries. We have to really first address that introspection. But while we're doing that, we cannot afford to just stay within ourselves because all of the different populations of color are experiencing racism. We are in an extreme time in our country where the previous president unleashed a whole lot of permissions to be openly and aggressively racist, sexist, um, anti-LGBTQ, anti-people of disabilities, anti-older people, anti-youth, unless you fall within the strict confines of who they perceive to be okay to be in this society, who is perceived to be not less than. So we do have an obligation to do that. And, so, and part of that obligation is being aware, educating ourselves, getting to know, getting to build, relationships across all of the different divides that we have had to experience and have been imposed upon us. I thank you. I thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the time. I, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here today, for sharing parts of your journey, where you are today, your vision, about what we need to be about and need to be doing. Sharing with many of those who are participating in this, who are wondering how do they move forward and what should their journey be and how do they find mentors or how do they move into leadership? And you actually serve as, as role models and guides for this process. And I thank you for that. I thank you for reminding us that we need to examine ourselves and always start in that space where we're examining ourselves as individuals, as groups, um, to be able to have that self-reflection, but to also join with others that there are all these boundaries and divisions that are put up to keep us apart, but they also weaken us when we are unable to see the ways in which we share a common ground um, and our common goals around equity and justice. And for me, it's not about how are you represented or how am I represented, but it's how are we represented. And oftentimes when we move into these positions, we are not representing one group or one person. We are the only one and we are representing everybody that's on the margins. Everyone needs to be in our thoughts and our mind and in our actions. So I thank you for all that you do, for all that I know you will continue to do. Thank you for being here today.